You're listening to Nothing's Off the Table, the podcast where no subject is too taboo to discuss. Now, please welcome your hosts, Andy Barker and Blue Bell Three. You know, like I was saying earlier, uh, no, I don't remember what I was saying. Anyway, welcome back, everybody, to Nothing's Off the Table. Uh, we have a guest tonight, uh, I would say special, but that would connotate many things, and he's not wearing his hockey helmet. But anyway, our guest tonight is uh, Matt Curran. Matt, we'll get to you in a minute, so don't say a word yet. Lou, welcome back, brother. Uh, I'm going to stop saying welcome hey. back to you because you're well. You're pretty much always here, so. Um, I, no, and I do have to apologize for missing last week, and, and, uh, and you know, for people that go back to the archives settle in i'm gonna give you a, 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 a quick story but the reason to settle in is i'm sure you'll all uh find um common ground here but so a first child uh nephew of mine uh from japan is an exchange student at um west virginia morgantown and he was supposed to come back last week on thursday meaning i could have made the show he decided to show up to japan without his visa to the states they're pretty serious there so while I advised him to fly to Mexico and walk across and he could still make his timeline, <laughs> he, he um, chose to follow the rules and, of course, had to get turned around, go back and get his visa in order to come back, which pushed the flight back, causing me to uh, miss and have to pick him up at the airport on Friday. So long story longer. Sorry. And uh, happy to be back, Andy. How, and how Matt, dare he? Going? How dare he? Anyway, you know, uh, we've got a great couple shows lined up for you tonight being one of them. I'm super happy to have Matt here, Matt. I'm going to brag on you a little bit. Uh, Matt's a retired uh, United States Marine Corps aviator. Um, it's a funny joke about that and specific reason why I said aviator. Uh, but you flew not only CH 46s, but you were also one of the first to fly the Ospreys, correct? It's true. Very true. So sure. Ospreys is, oh, you know, I've never been in an Osprey and uh, I never, ever want to get into an Osprey. But anyway. When I lived on New River, we used to find pieces of them in our backyard. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Let yeah. me, uh, let me quick tell you the aviator story real quick. And then, then I'm going to let you dive in. You have a fascinating, powerful story. Um, and I, I'm so excited for the listeners to be able to hear it. I'm going to try not to get emotional during the telling of your story. I've heard your story. I don't know how many times and every time I hear it, I get choked up a little bit, but the aviator thing. So when I was a second class, I was an E5 and I got stuck. I just got dropped from the recon pipeline. So I was already been a miserable bastard to begin with, but I worked for this Lieutenant. She was a, uh, my department head she was a nurse corps officer and she was married to a naval aviator. Uh, I think he flew 18s. I don't really remember. It doesn't matter. Well, anyway, he came in one day and, and he stuck his head in my office to introduce himself. And I said, oh, I hear you're a pilot. And he goes, no, I'm a naval aviator. I said, oh, 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 wait a minute. Do you fly planes? He goes, well, yeah. I said, well, get the hell out of my office then, freaking aviator. But anyway, so I always kind of laugh at the the audacity and, and the ego of some of them freaking cats. Uh and I'm proud to say that you're not one of them. Uh, exactly. So Exactly. But without further ado, I, I'm very honored to have you here. And let's just get into it, man. Uh, yeah. Because it's so... Lou, I didn't tell you anything on purpose. I want you to hear this and I want to see a genuine reaction. So, Matt, tell us your story. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about myself just to let everybody know who I am and then we'll jump into... Uh, what makes me who I am. How about that? And uh, okay. it's my story. And Fair so, uh, yeah, I'm from uh, North Carolina, born and raised Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, went and played baseball at UNC Greensboro, met my wife there. Uh, I've been married 28 years. So uh, have three kids, have a son who's 26, a daughter who's 23, just started medical school at Georgetown. Let's give it up uh, yeah. last week. So that's pretty good. And I have a sophomore at, um, I have a sophomore who's at UNC Chapel Hill, and uh, she and I are actually writing a book. We can kind of talk, touch on that a little bit later. Uh, you know a little bit about that story. Uh, left college, went into the Marine Corps, and uh, became a naval aviator. Uh, <laughs> 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 no, I became a helicopter pilot for the Marine Corps, flying CH-46 Echo, the whistling ship can of death, right? So, um, 
you know, so it's uh, really to this day, my favorite uh, helicopter I've ever flown uh, by far, you know, and um, so it was good. I, I went in, uh, flew helicopters, ended up getting medically retired out of the Marine Corps 2007, stayed in the V-22 Osprey program, uh, went and became an air medical pilot, flew six years as an air medical pilot, 659 patient flights. Uh, watch the first responders do amazing things, watch people lose their life and watch some of these first responders, you know, keep people alive. So it was really, really awesome. Something I'm proud of, uh, right place, right time, uh, became the helicopter pilot for team Penske NASCAR and Indy, uh, still in that today. Uh, so I fly the helicopter for those two teams. And then I also fly Gulfstream, uh, 280, uh, for Penske, uh, which is a jet, which is pretty cool that they let a helicopter pilot fly a jet. And uh, so that's pretty fun. Um, but I say all that, that's my side gig. And, uh, you know, I just do that as a, as a hobby, flying those things. And what I really do is I have an online platform. It's called Convene Communities. And it's based around, I believe that we all have a story and we all have something to share. Uh, things that we've gone through in life, either good things or bad things uh, that kind of lead us to what, you know, our passion. Um, and it's incumbent on us to share that stuff with others for the good of others. And I, I truly believe that. And um, so my story, wow, let's talk about that, you know. So I was a 46 driver uh, out of Marine Career Station, New River, HMM 365, great squadron, great group of people, love them all to this day. Uh, so it was July 9th, 2001, and we were going out to do a routine training exercise. So we were going to go down on the New River uh, there, and we were going to practice uh, shipboard landings on what was called the LHA deck on the New River. So I was a night systems instructor. That means that I taught people how to fly on the goggles. And then uh, we had, in my aircraft, had a crew of five. We had myself. I was teaching the lieutenant how to fly, you know, at the LHA deck that night. We had a uh, main crew chief, uh, instructor crew chief, Sergeant Salah. Uh, he was the instructor in the back. He was teaching the new guy how to fly night vision goggles on the, at the LHA deck. We had an aerial observer, uh, Gunny uh, Collins, who was back in the back there, sitting in the other window, looking out and clearing us. And so that was who was in my aircraft. The other aircraft had a, a crew of five as well. And so, so as we got ready to go, we briefed the flight and we were, you know, I went down to sign for the aircraft. We call it signing for the book. Basically, that's you get the keys and it's, you're going to get cut loose, ready to go and go fly. I walked into the, um, I walked into maintenance control and I saw Sergeant Beatty. So let me explain who Sergeant Beatty is real quick. So the day I got to HMN 365 and I'm wearing my alphas, my, you know, the green uniform and here I am, I'm Captain Curran. Uh, and I get out of the car, this uh, young corporal gets out of the car, his car, and he's wearing his alphas too. He salutes me and uh, salute him back, and we just start shooting the shit, walking up and uh, talking, and it's uh, Clark Beatty is, is his name. So what Clark and I didn't really know is that at that time we were getting ready to be attached at the hip. I walked in and I went over to the XO to check in. He walked in, he went to the Sergeant Major to check in. When we walked out of that, we were combat uh, partners. Uh, he was my combat crew chief. So what did that mean? That meant that we were trained together. We would uh, do everything, almost everything that we did, the majority of our flights together, we'd really get to know each other. So if we hit combat, we knew how each other worked, right? A little bit about Clark is he had been a former army uh, tank guy. And so he's a little bit older. He's actually older than I was by a couple of years at the time. So truly respected him because he had life perspective, you know, more so than me. And I also was told one time, and I took it to heart when I was in flight school, is that your crew chiefs can be your best friend. They can be your worst enemy. They don't like you. If you're a jackass to them, you might go out to the aircraft store. We can't go fly. It's broke. And then two hours afterwards, it's fixed magically. You know, if they don't, if they don't like you, they're not going to fly with you, you know. So you treat everybody with respect. And so Clark and I became the, the best of friends. I'm, when I tell you the best of friends, we were the best of friends. We grew up together, Operation Allied Force in Kosovo. When I went to WTI uh, in Mott, he was at WTI as my crew chief as well, going through WTI. So we did everything together. So we were supposed to be on this flight this night together. And I walked in and I saw him and I was like, hey, bro, give me the book. And he goes, well, hey, we're not flying together now. They had just changed it uh, a couple hours prior. 
we're not flying together now, but we're together tomorrow night. All right, good, good to go. I'll see you tomorrow night. Um, and so we go and, and we're ready to take off. So I'm the lead aircraft. He's in the Dash 2 aircraft now. So we take off and we take off single ship. We had been delayed a little bit because there had been weather that had come through. And so we were delayed, thunderstorms. And um, so we departed single ship. I went down there, got to the LHA deck first. I'm bouncing. They get down there. They're, they're bouncing. And lo and behold, in my aircraft, we had a um, aircraft issue, right? And so in that aircraft issue, we had landed at the front of the LHJ deck and we were talking about it. And uh, we were talking about what was going on. So I said to the gunny in the back, I said, uh, or the gunny said to me, uh, to us, the whole crew, he said, hey, they're on downwind. I'm like, good to go. Everybody's head turns in the back. Now I'm seeing, I'm on night vision goggles. So if you've never been on night vision goggles, picks up on light and I'm seeing these flashes going on because there's still lightning in the area, right? So I'm seeing this lightning flashes in my goggles, but it's not really close to us anymore. Um, and so the gunny says they're on downwind. I'm like, good to go. We continue talking about the situation. I remember seeing this kind of bright flash, you know, I didn't think nothing of it. And we kept talking. Finally, I said, hey, Gunny, can I lift? He goes, sir, did they call the party? And I'm like, no, they didn't call the party. So Sergeant Salah was who had switched with Clark Beatty. He had just got to the squadron from a, a, a 46 squadron from Okinawa. So that's why he was flying with me. So Clark wanted him to get to know me. We get inside, you know, so he's inside the aircraft and he goes, you know what the fuck you mean, Gunny? Aircraft just don't disappear. Sticks his head out the window. He goes, sir, there are rocks in this water. And I was like, no. He goes, sir, come up now. They're in the water. So I lift up, kick the tail, turn my searchlight on, and there they are. It looked like the best way I can explain. Everybody's seen, everybody's seen aircraft that have crashed, and and there's debris field. You know, that's what it looked like. It was a debris field in the water that went all the way from what we call the 90 position, so about you know 50, 60 yards out, all the way up to the edge of of the LHA deck. You know, it was all like up to us. You know. But I could see the helicopter sticking up out of the water. We could see the helicopter still in, up out of the water. So we lift up, we pull up, we kick the tail, we pull over. Uh, we're going around, we're looking for them. Um, the, in the back, they're sitting there trying, saying, hey, pull into a hover, we'll jump out. Well, if I can see the helicopter sitting out of the water, that's probably not the best idea to let them jump out. There's also a thing called a uh, called the... Uh, waterfall effect and so what that means is you go up and you get down into water it's gonna that rotor wash is gonna pull water up off the surface and it's gonna go down so you're gonna think that you're climbing and you're gonna take power out when you take that power out you're gonna settle right into the uh, right into the water with them so not such a good idea so that was kind of hard because they were like hey sir give you a pull up let us jump out and I'm like no nope, we're not gonna do that <laughs> you know so we were going back and forth so how did you know, what do we do? We got to get our peers out of the water. So we see a helmet pop up. We see another helmet pop up. We go, we see a helmet, somebody climbing around the on the aircraft. So we know we got two survivors in there, but there's five total in the aircraft. And so we go and we drop, um, we drop a raft. Um, and that raft goes off because it gets blown away. Um, so nobody's holding on to the raft. We see the two helmets come together um and we drop another raft so we're sitting there and we're like okay what do we do now and so we inside the aircraft we're talking about all our options we go land back on the lha deck and we send the gunny in the water right go out there get the survivors and bring them back because they're just standing in the water they're not getting in the raft they're just standing there holding on to the raft and the reality was is they were beat up pretty bad they had injuries and all that so they couldn't even physically get into the raft so we send the gunny down he goes down the embankment goes into the water and um you know we're still like okay what do we do you know i'm facing now i'm facing the water so we're looking at the wreckage and i'm like well what do we do you know at the time we had started the on-scene commander you know i was the on-scene commander so we're talking to everybody we're getting all the all the people coming and so we have what's called pedro up out of cherry point that's the rescue helicopter they're still 20 minutes away or 20 minutes away when we first called i mean we it this felt like we were on the accident scene for a freaking hour we were on there for minutes you know when as this was going how fast it was taken um where we were on the Camp Lejeune complex, it was still taking a long time for, you know, crash fire rescue to get to us and EMS to get to us. 
And so look, so we're sitting there trying to think of everything we can do. So Gunny's in the water. He gives us a call on the radio. We know we have two survivors. So we're starting to figure out what's, our, what's going on. We just don't know where the other people are. We don't know what's going on. Um, so over the horizon comes Pedro. And here comes Pedro. Okay, it's good. Pedro's here. You know, get the diver in the water, see if we can figure something out. So Pedro pulls up into a hover. And when I pull up into the hover, diver goes down. Diver's down less than two, three minutes. Diver comes back up alone. And they pull over in front of us. So their helicopter's facing our helicopter. My crew chief's on the, uh, Sergeant Salah's on the long cord. And what ends up happening is the diver gets out, comes over there, you see him talking. And then um, Sergeant Salah says, sir, take me home. I want to go home. They're all dead. I want to go home. I mean, I remember those words, just like he's saying them to me right now. Sir, take me home. I want to go home. They're all dead. I want to go home. And that was it. You know, we had the two survivors. The two survivors were the two pilots somehow. Three crew chiefs in the back died. Um, and Sergeant Beatty died. And I was supposed to fly with Sergeant Beatty the next night. And Sergeant Beatty was not just Sergeant Beatty. I could give a crap about rank. Sergeant Beatty was one of my best friends. He's the guy that I grew up with, the guy that we did everything together. He knew it, my moves. I knew his moves. He knew if I said something with an inflected voice, you know, he knew exactly what I was uh, you know, thinking. It didn't, you know, we knew each other. And so yeah we went we went home and uh we took off from the new river i turned over on scene commander to some uh other aircraft and the first responders that were there and we flew home and what was crazy is we flew up the new river it was dead calm dead calm and then we didn't say one word outside of me making radio calls you know to get us back on the airfield and when we got back on the airfield, you know, um, we landed and um, there were people waiting for us. But let me back up about the, I couldn't believe how quiet it was. I'm sitting here looking out and although you had the helicopter sounds going on, it was dead silent inside the helicopter. Nobody said anything. And it was ironic to me because it, I just remember looking down the water and the water was glass. Hmm. But back behind me was chaos. Back behind me, we just lost three Marines, you know? And so when we land, they're waiting on us. So I get out of the helicopter. When I get out of the helicopter, you know, somebody meets me. And we have five people there, and each of us get assigned somebody, and they take us in. We weren't at the helicopter that crashed, but this is how it works, right? They're going to take us in. They get our, they got to get our statements. They separate us. We have to go pee in a cup, you know? And so at the time, we lived on base housing. And my wife and I lived on base housing, had two kids at the time. And I remember, you know, it was 11 o'clock midnight. I, I can't remember exactly what time it was, but, and this is important, man. This is, this is shows how it affects families. You know, it's not just you, the, the veteran or the, the, the military man or woman, it's the family at the same time. And so, I called my wife. They let me have one phone call, like some, you know, one phone call. And I called my wife and she said, she said to me, and I think it's 2001. And nobody was just running around with your cell phone at the time, you know? Um, so I call the phone rings at the house. She answers and she says what she says. So she's like, why are you calling me? She is Matt. Why are you calling me? And I was like, well, I'm going to be home tomorrow. Um, and she goes, what happened? And she goes, Matt, did somebody die? That's the first, first words out of her mouth. Did somebody die? You know, she knew that for me to be calling her, something bad had happened. And she knew that I would not be calling her and telling her I was coming home tomorrow unless something tragic had happened. So at first she was like, did somebody die, Matt? Who died? And I was like, oh, well, you know, and I can't say anything because I got somebody standing like one foot from me listening to everything that I'm saying. And she's like, are you okay? And I'm like, I'm okay. And uh, she goes, Matt, who died? I need to know who died. 
and I can't say anything to her. I'm just, I can't say a word, you know, they're listening and they start telling me to hang out the phone, tell her you'll be on tomorrow, hang out the phone. And I just said, Hey, I love you. I'll be home tomorrow. And you know that my wife, we lived in base housing. She walked out of the house and walked the whole neighborhood looking and counting cars, looking at my squadron mates houses to see who was there and who wasn't there. And the sad thing was, is that there were some cars missing because as soon as we activated the, the, the plan, some of the guys, my friend Dave Sadler from right down the street, you know, she's seeing his house and his car's not there because he's the safety officer. So he's in the squadron now, you know, so she goes the whole night until I get home. I ended up getting home about five thirty, six o'clock in the morning thinking that, you know, she doesn't know. She doesn't know if somebody else is, you know, husband, wife, or who? She has no idea. So yeah, so I go home, I take a shower, I crawl into bed, she just holds me, and I cry. I just cry. Did you sleep at all? I did. I eventually fell asleep, you know, I eventually fell, but not for long, because I, I woke up, you know, thinking I got to go figure out what happened. I got to figure out what's going on. Right. You know, your mind's spinning at the time. You, you're thinking, you know, what we're thinking at the time, my whole crew is that we failed them, right? We failed. We failed these three Marines. Yeah, we should have gotten them out. We should have saved their lives. And to be honest with you, that is uh, because of that, we, you know, they could tell we were asking the questions. I got called into the CO's office with the doc and um, they read the autopsy report to me. And the message was, pull your crew together and let them know that you did everything that you could. Um, everybody died instantly, the three in the back. No, nobody suffered. And that was important for us to know. Because if they would have suffered in the back, we would have felt like we failed. You know? Um, so the autopsy report was not a pretty autopsy report from what happened, but it was, it was at least we knew that we didn't fail them, you know? We ended up going out on the LHA deck, I have a picture of it, you know, uh, but we went and listened uh, and we went and sat there and we watched them pull the helicopter out of the water. And that was, you know, you got a gunny, you got a uh, captain, you got a gunny, you got a, a sergeant bawling, bawling because they're, that's our guys right there. That's our peers. So we found out what happened. We knew what happened. We knew exactly what happened because one of the, the pilots survived. So you find out the story behind what happened and what it, what it was is that we were flying night vision goggles. Um, and we, they were coming in, we're at 300 feet, 80 knots. So we're already pretty low as it is when it comes to aviation. And they, they come around from 300 feet, 80 knots and, um, and they go down to 200 feet, 60 knots and 150, 50, and then I'll find out to land. Um, well, what happened is, is that in the 46 above the left seat guy is where the anti-collision lights were. So the lights are right here to him. And we would attach a straw to the anti-collision lights. I don't know if y'all did that in the shitter, but uh, in the 53, but um, we would attach that straw to it so you could know to turn off the anti-collision lights. Well, the reason why is because if literally the light would bounce off the ship and come back and, you know, you would see it in your goggles, but it would also, you got a guy who's calling you in an LSC and he's calling you in and he's got goggles on too. So you're blinding him if you don't turn the anti-collision lights off. But at the time we had not changed all of our helicopters over yet in the Marine Corps and 46 is from having a red cockpit dome light to night vision goggle MVG compatible lighting. That transition was still going on. So when the, pilot in the right seat who was a short he was a shorter guy he would take his kneeboard off he'd reach over and he'd turn the anti-collision lights off because he couldn't reach it he went forward and turned the red cockpit dome light on so the goggles do what we call blooming out they turn off but it doesn't mean you can't fly you can still fly the aircraft in fact you brief it you level the wing center the ball pull power climb away from the ground we'll talk about it in the air but it's right here to this guy he's the one at the controls everybody's trying to get the lights off and so what ended up happening is Clark was in the back. He was on his gunner's belt. He told 
um, the crew chief in the window, help them get the light off. I'm moving up. He unhooks to move up. Crew chief in the window unhooks and he goes in the tunnel to turn the light off. And then there's somebody, the air observer guys sitting over here in the, th in the window. Well, they were all unhooked and the guy was in the window and uh, they all, again, died on impact. But what happened is the guy lowered the power, the guy flying lowered the power um, and nobody's flying the helicopter. So they, when I speak, I call, you know, the topic when I'm speaking uh, about this, I call it 12 seconds that changed everything. Because for me, that 12 seconds that went on inside that helicopter that they estimate was 12 seconds uh, changed my life. It has changed everything for me. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we lost three Marines. Now, the hard part is this for me found out a year and a half uh, prior, another squadron had had a mishap, right? Had a mishap that had the same causal factor that turned on the red cockpit dome light on and they kept it a secret. They didn't tell anybody outside of their squadron. Do you know how fast a crew chief could go and change a single toggle switch to a dual toggle switch? Because that was the problem, you could turn it on but to turn the switch off, you had to pull it and put it in the off position. If you had a dual toggle switch, you could beat it with the knee board, beat it with the knee board, because we tried, and it would never turn on. And if that red cockpit dome light had never turned on, we would have never lost those three Marines. So it was a senseless, senseless mishap with three lives that should have never, never been lost. And it's just, it, it, every day of my life it affects me every day so that's my story I'm that day i when we were sitting on that lhj deck i prayed to god that i would make a difference by helping people not make mistakes over and over and that i would not let clark Beatty's death and those other two marines their deaths go unnoticed and so that's what i do that's what i'm dedicated to is that mission right there? I, I can tell you, I've, I've heard this story several times now from you. And I feel the raw emotion from you the same every time you tell it. It's obvious yes. that you're reliving it when you tell it. Yeah. And, and oh, yeah. my heart goes out to you, man. My heart goes out to the families of those that were lost. Um, yeah. Yeah. Matt, um, so so during your story, you you touch on it, um, and I want to talk a little bit more about it because I don't I don't think people understand, you know, and, and um, like you said, everybody has a story, you know, and I, and um, I have a few similar ones, um, but people don't understand when these incidents happen, there is it, it, there is a process, and that process will be executed prior to any grieving. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it, it is very and it is very sterile, and yeah. it is very unemotional. And it is incapable of caring about you about how you feel at the time, sure. Because that process must be executed. Yeah, yeah. You have to go through the process, and and, and I don't necessarily fault that process because you got to get the facts straight. And you got to do it like right away. You got to get the details and the facts so you know what's going on. I mean, I think our squadron and the way it was handled at the time was actually pretty good. You know, we rolled through it, and then we the next day, starting the next day, they had people on us helping us, you know, and, and this is 2001. It's even better, I would say now, uh, that process. Uh, but I, we just, we came from a, I'm just gonna be honest with you. We came from a freaking squared away squadron at the time. This was, this was out of nowhere for us. And, um, but I, I'll also say I've never, I've lost, okay. And I don't mean this to sound, callous or anything, but I've lost multiple friends. I've lost, I've seen other people that I've lost in the military. I've never seen any other mishap or any other loss that still to this day impacts so many people. Mm -hmm. It starts on July 8th and goes all the way through July 9th. The texts, the emails, the, the, the messaging, the post on social media, people going to Clark's grave every July 9th, you know, to tip one back, you know, mm -hmm. it, he had such an impact and those guys had such an impact on this water. It's amazing. I, it, it just, 
it's who he was. It's how it was. But to your point, yeah, when it happens, man, it's by the book. It's by the freaking book, you know, and it's 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 freaking raw. The whole damn thing is raw. I, I advocated um, at, at, after, um, you know, having having a, a different scenario, but similar sort of structure. Um, you know, you're so exhausted um, emotionally, physically. You know, you don't realize how physically exhausted yeah. you are until everything's over. Like you're so tense. Everything yeah. is just exhausted. And um, what I said to the sergeant major after my situation was just somebody to help me. Just yeah. s- somebody who could have thought. Because I couldn't even think, and they were asking me for things that um, I understood took precedent, you know, like like this thing, these things, like you have to give your drug sample. Yeah. You know, these things have to be done. Those things have to be ruled out. But somebody who could have been there to say like, yeah, okay, now, now pee in this cup. Yeah. (laughs) You know, it was the small things that I just couldn't, it it was, you know, things were so overwhelming and now I'm exhausted. And I said, I just would have loved to have had help. Um, and like I said, I think like you agree, uh, like you're saying, you know, yeah. um, as more of these instances occurred, they've gotten better. But boy, for the few of us that were there in the beginning, oh, that, yeah. pro- that and, and I think that adds to, you know, how you remember the situation. Well, I do remember. I do remember being pissed off. Like, why the hell am I peeing in a cup? What my damn aircraft? You know, why, why are you all over me about being in this cup? You know, it's frustrating. Go ahead. Mine can only take so much before sure, it shuts down absolutely. in a traumatic event like that. Um, yeah. and I don't, I don't want to cheapen any of the, the deaths or take anything away from the 20 years we had at war, but let's be honest, this was peacetime still. This was peacetime. Yeah. So we weren't used to Train. taking the casualties, you know? And so that oh, yeah, hits yeah. you even harder. Um, yeah, it's July 9th of 2001. We didn't know nine 11 was going to happen. Right. So this man. is, this is peacetime and then when you get hit with that it didn't need to happen that's what just baffles my mind is that you're talking about a mechanical thing yes that was human error yes that was human error that caused the mishap level the wings in the ball pull power climb away from the deck you know but the the red cockpit dome light should have never got turned on and that could have been avoided if people would have just spoke up in that other squadron. Yeah. Not, you know, it's but it's a systematic thing that goes on, not just in that, not just in uh, that squadron in those times, but it's it's everywhere. It's all over the freaking country, you know. Uh, it's in hospitals. It's in aviation. It's in corporation. It's in, you know, relationships, marriage. I mean, it's everywhere. If we would just talk about things and share our stories about things that we're going through, maybe these things wouldn't happen. You, you know? know, if there was only a platform out there. If there was only a platform. <laughs> That's right. You like yeah. that segue? That was a good segue. Yeah, that was a good segue. Yeah, it, you know, like I said, I, I dedicated everything to it. I mean, even when I, I was in the Marine Corps, I, like, literally, I went and um, I would speak at this. I would, I would get pulled into um, – I became a decision-making, so to speak, expert. Like I talked about the process of decision-making and crew resource management and team communications and all that. So I would speak at different safety stand downs. I would speak wherever they let me speak. When I got to the V-22, I started a training program uh, for the V-22. And then I got medically retired. And when I got medically retired, I didn't stop. I stayed with the V-22, but I started doing this out in the corporate world. I'd get pulled out and speak in different, different places. Um, and I always believe that, you know, I was sitting in the, in a restaurant with a guy, uh, a mentor of mine. And, um, I told him, I said, I want to create a, and I was thinking aviation at the time. I said, I want to create a, a website where people can share their lessons learned, you know, for the good of others. I said, and I tell you know, because that, again, the other squadron didn't share it. And I said, you know, off, you know, we we're talking about, and I said, you know, he was a pilot, former pilot, uh, too, as well. And I said, often what ends up happening, let's say that, you know, the three of us are in the aircraft together and we're flying and we do some stupid shit, you know, we're going to get, before we get out of that aircraft, we're going to look at each other and say, okay, what just happened in that aircraft stays in that aircraft. We're not talking about how stupid we just were, how we just tried to go kill ourselves. And we would keep that stuff a secret. But that's actually the wrong answer because the right answer is if we something goes wrong and we do something stupid or something happens with the aircraft, 
the right thing to do is go share that story with others so they don't go out and do the same thing that we just did. You know, and I see this all, all the time, like I said, in, in corporate aviation and aviation everywhere uh, and corporate business and stuff still to this day. But the reality of it is, is like as I would go out and, and speak about this, it would, I just would gain momentum and people would come up and they would want to talk to me about. Let, let me interrupt only, you for a quick second, yeah. because it's important what you just said. We were joking in the beginning when I told the story about the naval aviator and the ego, right? But the ego is such an important factor. The That's what ego, you're talking about. The ego is what kept them from reporting that incident. Correct. So absolutely. It, it's so stupid that like, and, and again, I want to emphasize it's not just aviation, but it's, it's, you can go across the board for everything. When we do some stupid stuff or some bad things happen, no, we don't want to share our dirt. We don't want to put our dirt out there because it's embarrassing. Cause what you just said, the ego, the ego is not going to let us put it out there. Right. And that's, that's the wrong answer. Right. The wrong answer is to put it out there. You know, life is not easy. Is it easy? Is life know. just always easy? No, life is not easy. Life comes with, go ahead. You know, I was going to say, you know, you know, I'm always, I'm always asking in the chief's mess, you know, when they say, I can't believe, I can't believe this guy lied to me. And I would sit in the chief's mess and be like, well, when was the last time we rewarded honesty? Yeah. I mean, I have two choices, you know, I tell yeah. the truth and I get screwed yeah. or I could lie and hope you don't know anything because <laughs> I'm going to get screwed anyway. <laughs> yeah. One of the things, you know, like I say, this applies to everybody and I'll segue to this as we're getting over to convene. But one of the things we haven't talked about is I have a degree in counseling now. Mm -hmm. And so I call it, I have this thing that I talk about all the time um, and it's with females, but it's really for males. It's the damned if you do, damned if you don't. And you see this a lot of time in relationships and you see this where where males screw up all the time. And it's because they got this wife over here going like this, <laughs> not picking on the wives because it could be the husband. Sure. But you think to yourself, uh, and early in my marriage, I was like this. You think to yourself, you know, oh, man, she's going to get pissed. She's going to get pissed. So I better just tell her this story, tell her this lie, because you think, well, I'm damned if I do, damned if I don't. You know, my wife, a stupid example I use, but it's so true. My wife would call me and say, where are you at? And I'd be like, I'm almost there. Hell no, I'm still 15 minutes away, you know, but I'm sitting there telling her I'm almost there, right. you know, because I'm, I'm trying to get away with it. And then I pull in and she's like, where were you really? You know, and I'm like, well, you know, I was still, and, and I'm getting my ass chewed either way. So what I'm had happened that. was. Yeah, what had happened was. But that's, a lot of people do that. You know, a lot of people just lie because yeah. of our pride and because, you know, all of that. Well, and, and we've created a system, particularly in the, in the military. I had, a, I had a mentor tell me one time, you know, see, you know, the, you know, he's like, all, all these people look all over here and all these things. He goes, you know, the biggest problem in the Navy is you can't get promoted with an evaluation that says you maintained a working system. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can't. They're not going to do anything for you. Yeah. You know, I came here, you know, I let it work. <laughs> yeah. We adhered to the rules, you know, and, and every, everybody went home. Yeah. You know, that, that guy is going nowhere. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> you know, and we've created right. this system where, you know, I have to be um, either first or, you know, one of the founding few. Because I have to set myself apart, yeah. and people I think lose track of the the the, the basics and the focus. You know, uh, you know the, the the simple things. You know, you take care of the people; the work take care takes care of itself. Yeah, and they lose That's sight right. of those things. I think for um, sure in the race that we've created. Yeah, for sure. So over time, what I've created is a platform where anybody and everybody can share their experiences with others. That's awesome. Their life lessons. And so I used to just do it business to business, going into corporation, hospitals, all of that. But what Convene does is allow people to take it and run in any direction that they want. So we have communities that are parenting communities. We have ones for teen young adults. We have uh, we have a lady on there who really she does she does incredible. She does the best. She teaches uh, veterans, just veterans, because she's got a passion for veterans, how to file for Social Security and disability benefits. Um, and, and it's amazing if you look at Lisa, uh, what's cool about that is she used to work at social security. Um, and then she became a disabled person was on social security. And then now, um, you, you know, now is back working, making money through convenience. So she doesn't have to be on social security and disability benefits. So she teaches people how to do that, but she's married to a Marine. Her son was a Marine and she just has, uh, 
a passion for veterans and all that. So, and you notice I said Marines because that's really what it's all about, you know? Um, Here we go. <laughs> so, yeah, so so the platform is pretty cool. Uh, the platform lets people take it and run in any direction that they want, you know, and I think that it's, it's pretty good. It's the idea behind it is, again, we all have something to share. We can all you know, share it for the good of others. And that's what people do with inside of the platform. So it's, it's, uh, it's awesome. It's awesome. It's good. What what I like about it is that you get out of it, what you put into it. Exactly. So take that how you want to, you could be, yeah, you can grow, you can grow special groups. Uh, you can grow within, but what here, here's one of the cool things too. Um, so in the in the Marine Corps, I don't know what if, you know if y'all are around units that called your um, Andy Mouse and Andy Mouse. Did you already have Andy Mouse? Right, that was our reporting something that was wrong anonymously. We called them Andy Mouses in my squad. <laughs> oh no, I never heard that. Right, yeah. <laughs> must be a, a dead yeah. air. air Call him a rat and kicked his butt. <laughs> <laughs> no. So all right, so it, inside of convene, there's a lot of anonymity. Right. And anonymity is important. So that we have discussion boards in there. We have things we call them. I don't call them a training or a, a course. I call them uh, I call them an experience. That's what I call it. And it's a, it, look, y'all understand this. The format of training is all scenario based training. It's all scenario based training. That's how we learn in life. Put yourself in a situation and we go through the process and we learn from other people. Yes. Hey, it's like if we sat there, we all have kids. Right. Uh, we were talking about that before. We all have kids. So we're sitting around as three dads. And I said to you guys, hey, I'm having this thing going on with my son. If you're in this situation, how would you handle it? Where are your answers going to come from? Your experience. Yeah. There you go. Your experience. So that's what I call the training mechanism with inside of Convene is an experience because we learn through experience. But when people answer the experience, they answer anonymously because they'll be much more open and honest. Uh, when people go into discussion boards, they have the ability to answer as themselves or answer anonymously. So it goes back to what you said. What you said, Doc, goes back to pride. If you have to put yourself out there and your big face and your big profiles on there and you're talking about your failure as a parent or something, let's just say, or you feel like you felt as a parent, are you going to come out? Am I going to come out as the creator founder of Convene? Am I going to say, uh, hey, I'm having this situation with my son, Braden Curran, and I want to know how all of you would handle it because people would be going, oh, what the hell is going By on By the over way, there? your your <laughs> son is a spitting image of a young, a young uh, Dennis uh, Miller. Yeah. The comedian. Hey, huh? said, people have said that for him. Yeah, here we go. That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's a great comedian. I love Dennis Miller. But, but you know, uh, that's why pride is one of the, the deadly sins. Yeah. It's a killer. Well, yeah. yeah. That's its own month. Yeah. If I could get rid of that, man, that's my kids right there. There's my son right there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I see. I got totally. my phone update. My daughter and my, my two daughters. So you dudes quit looking at my daughter. Yeah, my daughter. Beautiful family. Beautiful <laughs> um, family. I, yeah. I've met. Yeah. I've had the you fortune to meet them. You and... them speak. Yeah, they, they came up on the stage with this event called Convene 23, and uh, they spoke about, you know, Convene, and uh, it was pretty cool. It was great moment for me so i want to i want to go into the pretend world real quick uh yeah i want to pretend like we have people watching and listening um yeah we do i was <laughs> with, watching with that one. being said yeah it's probably I can't, you know you. so i can't multitask i have no i have to trust andy i have <laughs> no idea i don't know any comments <laughs> but let's say let's just pretend that we have people listening and yeah and you know what can convene communities do for them? Why should they go to convene communities? Yeah, no, I think it's great. Everybody will come up and say, "Well, why? Why not a Facebook group? Why not a? Um, why not a why LinkedIn a Facebook group?" group? Yeah. yeah. Well, the reality of it is, is what convene does for is it gives you a, a, a more. We'll use the word intimate, right? It gives you a more closed-in space. It's also convene communities, right? The word convene means to come together uh, in communities. And so I've, I've been convened communities since 2014. If you look, that's kind of a buzzword, the word community. We create communities. Well, hell, I've been creating communities forever, right? So coming together in communities. So, for example, a parenting community, 
Uh, we'll just use that one as the example. It's funny Apparently, you bring that up because, you know, I've been creating my own little communities all around the world for 32 years, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> exactly. Uh, exactly. You're the reason Americans have to get a visa to go to Europe now. <laughs> But in the community setting, in the community setting, right, it's um, it's if you're looking for somebody, if you're looking for stuff on Facebook, let's say, for example, about parenting, you're in there with every damn thing. If you're looking yes. for something about parenting inside of Convene, it's just parenting. It's all driven towards parenting. The other thing is you have a lot of people out there doing great things about parenting. Well, what what's one group might do is not what the other group might do. There's so many different people had different expertise in different places. So, you know, the idea that we're, we're working through and we're doing is creating these communities of interest and bringing people together, you know, and again, inside of the community uh, aspect of it, it, it really is to help people out. For example, we have a military and veteran community. There's absolutely no freaking reason that we don't have, you know, all military veterans having a one-stop shop to support each other in that because that's what we should be doing. So to your point, Lou, that you had earlier is I, I look, the, the reality of it is, is peer to peer counseling and peer to peer. I, I, I have a degree in counseling, right? I do not believe that I can go and, and counsel in some areas, but you know what? I'm pretty freaking good at sitting there and working with veterans and working with first responders because I've been a veteran for with with a story and i have been a first responder and have been there and done that too so i can sit in a group i can sit in there with people um and i can i can you know work through that because i will tell my story it is true and authentic and raw and what i do when i tell my story is i break down the barriers there to begin with and if you've been there and you've done that and you've walked it and you've lost friends you know that i understand because I've been there and gone through it. So peer-to-peer -peer counseling and, and these types of things are so freaking important. I don't think, and I'm throwing it, throwing it out there, but I think it's very hard for people to go and relate to people that are not veterans. And I think it's hard for those veteran counselors to relate to us because they have never been there and they have never lost a friend like we've lost our friends. Well, I've said it many, many times in the past, I will continue to say it, that I feel peer-to-peer -peer counseling is way more effective than, yeah. than a, a, let's just call it a mental health provider client relationship. It is. And there's a place for that, sure. you know, for that, but it's not, you need to be doing both. You, we need to be lifting each other up. We need to be supporting each other. You know, yeah. we need to be able too. to look at each other and say, yeah. Hey man, I've been there where you are. And I've overcome it. I have a feeling that a lot of veterans, and, and I'm saying this in, a, in the nicest way I can, we need to be there to support and pull our veterans up because if we don't, they stay down in the bottom. They stay down in the pit and they don't think they can pull themselves up. And let's just you know? face it. Sometimes you know? they need somebody to say, strap your damn boots on and let's go. Right. Uh that, that's what I was going to point about it. You know, the other thing about peer to peer that I find sometimes too, is when I'm talking to veterans, I'm like, come on, come, come on now, you know, it wasn't like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> now let's, you, you know, I'm, I'm with you. I understand. But now, you know, so, we, we, they, they helped us a lot here and, and you know what I mean? And, you know, so getting people this, back on the positive aspects of their service as well. You know, so we were doing this call, we were doing this group call. It was, it was like a group podcast. We were caught smoking and joking. Um, and it was, it was, you know, where we all just got on in a group and we basically, it's like standing around the fire pit, the smoke pit, whatever. And we're smoking and joking, right? That's a, a term that we military men and women like to use. So what it turned into after a couple of good sessions, but what it turned into is people coming on and it was almost like a bitch session, a wine session of how, you know, it was very, very negative. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget, good friend of mine, Army veteran, right-hand man and convene, Eugene Brown. We're on this call, and this gentleman gets on the call, and it almost sounded like we were at an AA meeting. Huh. And what I mean by that, I'll use my name as Matt. This guy gets on the call, and he goes, hi, my name is Matt. 
And it's like everybody went, hi, Matt. And he said, and I'm a two-time suicide survivor. And I remember thinking to myself, looking around like, what was that? Because he said it with pride. He well, said he's, it he's a failure. Pride. But that's what I mean. It's like, it's like, you know, with that, it's like, yeah, he's a failure. He I'm, failed I'm, I'm too. Kidding. I'm kidding. I'm with you. But but the point is, it's like, why are you saying it with pride? Right. Why yeah. are you on this call saying I'm a two-time suicide survivor? And it was just the tone that it came out of his mouth that was shocking to me. And Eugene, Eugene drew the same conclusion because mm-hmm. we got off that call and I caught him. And he said, I already know what you're going to say before you say it. What was that? And it was like, we shouldn't take pride in that. Right. You know, and it's not yeah. that, that we don't want to pull people through. People have gone through the time. They have they have almost committed suicide. But to say it on there like it was the norm, <laughs> that's what it was. It was a norm. <laughs> and it was shocking. Hey, what, uh, well, what okay. school oh, did you get your degree from your council. I went to this school called Liberty University and I, another good friend of mine is going to start his um, his degree, getting his counseling degree from Liberty University here oh, do real tell. soon. Do tell. Yeah. He's this great guy. Love the guy to death, but no, he's no, going to start. Shit. Yeah. Well, I'm lying, but I'm just being honest. <laughs> but my friend Doc is getting ready to get the same degree nice. from Liberty University. Let's go. Let's give it up. I get that, I get that, I get that. <laughs> so Matt, if somebody wants more information about convening communities or just wants to reach out and talk yeah. to you about your story, how, how can they find you? Yeah. Go to convenecommunities.com is the, the place convenecommunities.com. That'll, that's the main website, but that'll get you in there. If you have an idea, if you have a nonprofit or an idea, or you're a entrepreneur, a solopreneur, a content creator, you you know, want to take your podcast that you're doing and put it up in the, in the community. Uh, Cause that's a great thing that podcasters do, by the way. Um, you know, Hey, it's a, it's a place that, you know, we're growing. We're always looking for people that have great ideas, a passion about doing things. Uh, you know, doc, you came and uh, videoed convene 23, our speaking event. Uh, we have more speaking events coming up where people can tell their stories um, and they can do that you know, with a group inside of convene, it's all about helping others. That's, that's what makes us different. Back to your point. What makes us different is we're here to help others. That's really what it is. It is a, it is a, uh, platform with a purpose. Is since, what we are. since you brought up the, uh, the conference, what I was pleasantly surprised about is that the people that were there were all from all different walks of life, different backgrounds, mm-hmm. but the passion was there. Yeah, exactly. And, so people, people have a story, right? You're helping Mark Ullman, this guy, Mark Ullman, pull out his story right now at the videos you've done for him. People have a story. They just don't know what to do with that story, right? There's nothing wrong with taking your passion and turning it into a business or into a profit. You just have to be guided through how you do, how you do that, and mm-hmm. we do it. Hey, and, and one other thing. Yeah, so convenecommunities.com, you'll, you can find ways to contact me on that. Uh, that's important. Um, uh, you can reach out to me, uh, Matthew Curran at convenecommunities.com. That's, that's too. But I want to talk about uh, two other quick things real sure. quick. Um, and sure, that's sure. This, Go ahead. Uh, yeah, but that's this organization that um, I didn't do anything as a veteran. Nothing as a veteran. I medically retired in 2007, and I went to this camp finally in 2019. And it was called the Wounded Warrior Umpire Academy. Oh. And another friend of mine, uh, this other dude, went through it because I had him go through it. Oh, you. Oh. You went through it. Oh, yeah. Became an umpire, right? But this th- it was an amazing thing. And and there's a spinoff from that that I'll talk to here in just a second. Um, but it literally helped change me because, one, I played college baseball, but I became an umpire through that. But it, it was the, the excuse is baseball. That's the excuse. It was my first time being around veterans. Now, I want to tell you about a key moment real quick is one of the things you're getting ready to go to Tucson to umpire in a tournament. I went to umpire in a tournament in Charleston, South Carolina. And the day that we were there to do that tournament was July 8th, 9th, and 10th. Mm. So I was in Charleston on July 9th. July 9th to me, I'm normally a freaking 
train wreck, you know, uh, those two days, it's like my anniversary day. Right. But guess what? First, first, the first July 9th that I did not cry. And you know, why I didn't cry. You're surrounded by your brothers. Yeah. I was surrounded by my brothers. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, uh, that's it. Uh, Wounded Warrior Umpire Academy. Uh, go check that out. The other is my roommate looked at me that night and he said, Hey, he said, you ever heard of this organization called Heroes to Heroes? And so Heroes to Heroes uh, takes veterans to Israel and you start, it's a 10 day trip. You start in Tel Aviv, you go up to the Golan Heights, you go down to the Sea of Galilee, get baptized in the Jordan, come through uh, Jerusalem, go down to the Dead Sea and then back up and you leave. It's a journey. But I put in for it. I was like, oh, that sounds pretty cool. Let me go do that, you know? And I ended up doing that and it was life altering, hmm. life altering. Um, it was one of the most amazing trips that I ever did. Now I just want to put a plug because if, if you, if you're a veteran, who's really in a bad way, really hurt and really needing some spiritual healing, go to heroes to heroes and take that trip. I'm getting ready to go back this next year as a, uh, team lead. Um, so I've gone from a participant to a team lead, but yeah, find plug in, plug into these resources out there if you're a veteran, because uh, it's so important. You know, that is an amazing segue because we just so happen to have a segment on this show and it's uh, <laughs> Veterans Helping Veterans. And uh, I think I, I take a lot of pride in this and I think Lou's going to go over something with us, but the Wounded Warrior Empire Academy is something we've, we've highlighted. Uh, the Heroes for Heroes is something that I'm very interested in. So I'm going to talk to you about yep. that offline. But anyway, it's that time, Lou. What do you got for us? Give me one second here because I, I lost the... Uh, oh, he was uh, so enthralled in my talking that... You know. I, you, you know what happened is I lost the web the web link is what happened. <laughs> um, but I'll tell you what, before, before I do Veterans Helping Veterans... The, 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 there was one thing I, I was trying to squeeze in about your convene committees, you know, the difference between, you know, where you are and where Facebook is. And I think it's an important distinction to make to people is that you're having an adult conversation as well. Yes. You know, there's nobody in there, it, it, you, you know, in Facebook, it's too easy for non-adults to creep in where yeah. you start arguing over, you know, what street the bakery was really on instead yeah. of what the concept of what happened in the bakery is what we're yeah. talking about. And then it. they, you know, and they're picking you apart over little things. These are adult conversations for adult, you know, for adults. And, and that's important. And I think, yeah. you know, providing that space, I think that's why you're there instead of these other, other yeah. places where it's too easy for people to come in and not, not be like an adult, I, but I, I did want to stick that out there. Yeah, I, I found it. what I saw to be adult oriented and I yeah. like that. Yeah. I appreciate you saying that. Cause that is so true. Yeah. Sure. All right. So quick veterans helping veterans, Andy. Thanks so much. Uh, we're going to look at the uh, Marine Corps League, uh, uh, a organization near and dear to my heart. Uh, I'm my local uh, junior vice commandant for the local chapter here. And uh, I did want to promote our website, which is the Three Rivers Leatherneck. Um, and I'll give you to you the exact one here. Three River, three, the number three rivers mcl.com. That's number three rivers mcl.com. Um, our webmaster uh, links to all the national news um, uh, as well as some of the local events that go on here in our Pittsburgh region. But um, you can get all the information you want off the Marine Corps League um, main website as well. Uh, they do uh, have re membership requirements. You do have to be a Marine or a Navy corpsman or chaplain who was stationed with Marines. They also offer affiliate membership as well. Um, so there is an avenue for um, non-Marine Corps or, or sailors who are not assigned to Marine Corps duties, but may have worked with Marines and other aspects. Um, and part of their charter uh, requirement uh, uh, to be a Marine Corps League chapter, you have to be a you have to have a program of veterans helping veterans. So check out your late, your local Marine Corps League or VFW. Um, but today we're highlighting the Marine Corps League, and you can check out number three riversmcl.com for more information if you'd like it. That's all I got. Excellent, Matt. I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. And I know we talk a lot all the time offline and everything, but it's, I feel it's so important to get your story out there to as many people as possible. It's not going to happen on this show because nobody watches, but, <laughs> but at least Lou got to hear it, you know? Um, yeah, I did. Right. Yeah. 
That's right. It's it's a powerful, powerful story, man. I, I started yeah. getting choked up again, but and I knew what was coming. And that's yeah. it's just I can't I can't even imagine what you go through. But you have to admit that talking about it is healing as well. Oh, talking about it is everything. Like I said, being being with other veterans, talking about it, that's why I talk about it, right? Mm-hmm. That's why I speak about it. That's why I, I go into corporations and, and talk about it and go into different settings and talk about it because the more you talk about it, the, the more you heal. And that's true for sure. So hey, don't leave when we say goodbye, but thanks for coming, Matt. Yes. <laughs> uh, that's right. Don't if, leave. If, if you are looking for some peer to peer counseling, if you're downloading this podcast off of the many platforms, you can always reach out to myself. You can reach out to Matt and I'm going to go ahead and speak for Lou and say, you can reach out to him as well. Um, sure. You're not alone. That's the most important thing to remember. And there's people that have gone through what you've gone through. It may not be exactly the same, but they've gone through what you've gone through. And, you know, talking about it is key, but, uh, Matt, again, brother, thank you so much for coming on the show. Stick around. We'll talk again in the room. Uh, But for now, uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks for listening. Comment, click like below. (laughs) Don't ever say that again. Oh, and I mean. If I get to 500,000 likes, I'll wear my underwear on the outside. I mean, ever say that again. And with that being said.